Moray King has been in this field probably longer than almost all of us put together. He started researching on this back in 1975 and doing presentations on zero-point energy. He has two books out, Tapping the Zero-Point Energy, which I have. It's a great book. It's one of my key resources, and also Quest for Zero-Point Energy. Uh, he's got a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineer and a Master's in Systems Engineering from the University of Pennsylvania. He's currently employed as a systems analyst and consultant, and he's been doing so much I can't even begin to describe because I, I remember seeing him as far back as 1986, maybe even earlier than that, uh, doing excellent presentations on the subject of zero-point energy. Here's Maury King. Thank you, Michael. Oh, I'm tethered down. Okay. Um, it's great to be here at a big conference. It's been a while since we've had a, a pretty big audience, and this has been, it's been terrific. And uh, a lot of people ask me about uh, my name. How in the world did I ever become uh, Moray? And uh, especially when people know about the energy device of T. Henry Moray. And because my mother is here in the audience, and she's heard me, this is the second speech she's ever heard, and um, I'm going to tell the story because, after all, it is her fault. <laughs> it was, um, I started back, I was, used to be a mild manner engineering student. I didn't believe in any of this kooky stuff of free energy or anything else like that. Everybody knew empty space was empty. And it was, uh, I encountered the book, My Meisner, Thorne, and Wheeler, Gravitation. I got introduced to geometric dynamics, found out about the zero-point energy. The literature was full of it. And I just started reading it. And I got invited down to Chris Bird's house to uh, uh, research the work of Townsend Brown, who had the electrogravitics, gravitational propulsion claims, and things like that. And that night, he threw a book in my lap. And he says, there's this kook out in Utah, can't write worth a darn, but this book is obviously for you. And when I read the author, The Sea of Energy in Which the Earth Floats by T. Henry Moray, and when I saw the name, it was like getting hit between the eyes by the two by four, and I said, you got my attention. And it was, uh, it was been tremendous synchronicity in my life where, where things happen, books fall off the shelf. Well, I gave my first speech in 1978. My mother was there. We invited John Moray to come out and talk about T. Henry Moray's energy machine. And after giving the speech, I introduced John to my mother. And the first thing he asks is, how did you come to name a Moray? I guess he thought there was some type of conspiracy or something. <laughs> and you know what? I never thought to ask. I was named Moray all my life. I just thought, OK, that's the way it is. So I was very eager to hear the answer. So this is what my mother said. She said she was attempting to name me after her father and her mother at the same time. And my grandfather was Morris. His nickname was Mo. And my grandmother was Rachel. Her nickname was Ray. So she concatenated the syllables together to make Moray. Didn't know anything about the eel, so I got to be named after an eel. So that's how I became Moray. <laughs> Well, one thing led to another, and it became my fate, I felt, that I am to explain in very, very clear terms how to actually tap the vacuum energy. And today is the unfolding of that explanation because it's very, very simple. And this entire presentation is simply a pattern to support a very simple idea, and here's how you do it. First, you create some glow plasma or corona, and then you abruptly pulse it with a unipolar pulse. The more abrupt, the better. The timing is important. Unipolar is important. And off of this, you launch a polarization wave that has excess energy. You create cold current. Sometimes you can make ball lightning. And what we'll do is we'll look across the spectrum of both in physics and in the inventors of this principle in action. First slide, please. I think if we cut the lights, it'll be better. And get me out of the way. Good. <laughs> well, once upon a time, all of science believed in an ether. 17th century, 18th century, it was supporting the propagation of light. Maxwell's equations was, was a fluid theory, it's fluid dynamics. They had vortices in the ether. And everybody believed that's the way it was. Next slide, please. Along came the Michelson and Morley experiment, 1905. Einstein used it to support relativity. And they banished ether 
from science. They said, well, if you can't feel the wind, if the earth moving through it, we'll just remove, we'll remove the, we'll remove the ether and, and space is empty. Next slide, please. But 1930, quantum mechanics came into play. They couldn't explain black body radiation. They couldn't explain why atoms were stable. Next slide. It led to quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, there was a term in the equation that represented this all-pervading energy. Next slide. It predicted this uncertainty, this uncertain jitter coming from the fabric of space. It also said pairs of elementary particles just magically appear from the fabric of space, Dirac's theory, electron-positron pairs. The vacuum was active. Notice history. 1905, the ether disappears from science. In 1930, it effectively comes back a 25-year gap in the history of science where we believed in an empty vacuum, and yet that dominates the engineering today. They still, the engineers still believe there's an empty vacuum. The good news is the physicists are jumping on board. Next slide. In fact, in the Physical Review, which is the Bible in the United States of what is real in physics, there's tremendous support to explain how everything can arise from the zero-point energy as the foundation. For example, there are quantum effects. All can be derived from the zero-point energy. Oh, there we are. Hydrogen atom stability by put, put off. They proved in 1993 that it can be tapped as an energy source without violating thermodynamics. They can produce artificial gravity, or gravity is the source in the zero point energy, and it can affect inertia. And if you know what you're doing with the zero point energy, if you know how to engineer it, you can create inertial propulsion. Next slide. Zero-point energy is now very popular in the field of quantum gravity. It is now young graduate students are entering, the mar are entering the field because of the tremendous successes that they're having. What quantum gravity theory says, they assume the zero-point energy and are able to derive both space-time and, and the elementary particles, in particular strings. So they're able to support both general relativity and string theory, all from one foundational theory. This has become very, very hot in the physics community. So now there's a tremendous interest in zero-point energy by the theorists. In fact, this is a model of a single vacuum fluctuation. The, the width is in space. It's on the order of 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters. It's 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the electron. It fluctuates very fast. That's the period, 10 to the minus 43 seconds. Next slide. The, the picture of space is like a virtual plasma. It's the seething turbulence of energetic microscopic particles, way, way smaller than any elementary charge. In fact, all of elementary charge is made from it. Those little holes are representing 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters with electric flux entering, and, and electric flux immediately leaves. This is, the more, this is a far more powerful ether theory than anything that they came up with in the 17th century. This is, this is a virtual plasma. It has energetic activity. And the question is, can it be engineered? So I said, can you tap that as a source? I asked the physicist back in 1976 when I learned about this. And their answer was, next slide, no way. It's random. It's chaotic. Random things must forever remain random. Isn't that the law of entropy? Next slide. 1977, just in the nick of time, Pringagine, Ilya Pringagine wins the Nobel Prize in Chemistry that shows how systems can go from chaos to, uh, to self-organization. Next slide. He developed three general principles in system theory. The system must be nonlinear, far from equilibrium, and have an energy flux through it, an energy, energy flux through it. The zero-point energy fulfills these principles. And thus, all you have to do is apply Pringagine's principles to the zero-point energy to build the point that you can tap it. Next slide. In fact, where does the energy come from? Wheeler's geometric dynamics models it as coming from a flux from a higher dimensional space. This is like a flatland slot. Pretend it's like a plane on the paper. It represents three-dimensional space, like a tabletop. And the thickness is related to Planck's constant. As the flux enters, it manifests as the turbulent zero-point energy, with a little bit of flux entering and leaving immediately our three-dimensional space. If there's a tilt to it, it represents vacuum polarization, electric fields and polarization, and the cold current polarization wave that we're interested in. If it has vorticity action, it represents elementary particles, it feeds the elementary particles, or if on a large scale, exotic vacuum objects that can be coherences in the zero-point energy. 
Next slide. How do we tap it? We follow Pringishian's principles. We work with a highly nonlinear system like the plasma, like the corona. We abruptly drive it far from equilibrium, the abrupt pulse. And we work with those elementary particles that have the maximum interaction with the zero point energy, and particularly the ions and the nuclei. Next slide. Conduction band electrons, electrons in normal wires, are effectively in thermodynamic equilibrium with the zero point energy. They don't affect it. They're, you can't get anything from it. There's hardly any interaction. That's the description in the literature of the vacuum polarization characteristic of conduction band electrons. Next slide. However, the nucleus is another story. Sharp converging lines of orderly vacuum polarization. The moving the nuclei is the key to stimulating the zero point energy into a coherent form that you can use to create an, an energy system that taps the zero point energy. Next slide. Do they see it in the experiments? Sure they do. In the standard collisions, heavy ion collisions experiments, they call them exotic coherent vacuum states in quantum electrodynamics from the heavy ion collisions. They see the anomalous formation coherence of the zero point energy in the accelerator experiments. Next slide. What happens if you do a group of them all together in phase? That's called the ion acoustic mode of the plasma. That's where we oscillate ions in phase. And guess what they see? Next slide. Literature is full of energetic anomalies they, dis they see. Large radiant energy absorption, high frequency spikes, runaway electrons, anomalous heating. They see tremendous anomalies in the plasmas when it's operating in that mode. By the way, this was the primary mode that T. Henry Moray kept saying is the, the fundamental mode for operating his machine. That was the basis of his machine, machine, ion oscillations. And I would just add the more important point is to jerk the ions. The more abruptly you jerk them, the better. Next slide. Eberlein agrees with me. She's a professor at Oxford University. She says she did her thesis on zero, activating zero point energy by abrupt movement of matter. It has to be very abrupt. That's the fourth derivative of, of velocity. The greater that is, the more abrupt the motion, the more zero point energy you activate. Next slide. She applied it to explain sonoluminescence. In sonoluminescence, we excite water with ultrasonic excitation. We see this mysterious bluish light come off of it. It's like it's the bluish spectrum is as if it amplified the energy over 100 billion times. It's like cracking a whip and getting this concentrated form of energy. Next slide. It's can't, Putterman proved it can't be from atomic transitions. What Everlene has shown that it's because of the collapse of the bubble. The bubble collapses down very, very rapidly and it puts in a very abrupt ion compression. And we'll see that again later in some inventions, that idea of an abrupt compression. It appears to create, if it was thermal energy, it would appear to be 40,000 degrees Kelvin. That's why a lot of people got excited over this. Holy cow, if temperatures are like that, that could produce fusion. Well, the good news is we're tapping the zero point energy. We're not creating heat. And the bad news is we're not really getting that much out. We're just getting some light, and it's really not that big of a deal in sonoluminescence. Next slide. Tesla was probably the first to observe and to be able to create the ball lightning effect. He would have to get in the magnifying transmitter, there was corona all over the place. If he got a phasing problem in the traveling wave up and down the, the magnifying transmitter, he could create a bucking field interaction at one point on the coil, and that would pop the ball lightning from the corona. Next slide. I'm going to feature these contemporary inventors. Whoa, where'd it go? Oh, there. Peter Gnu and his exploding water experiments. Joseph Papp, I'm going to apply what we learned from Peter to Joseph Papp's noble gas engine. Uh, Ken Shoulders probably hinges it together. He's got the best science. He creates these EVs or these microscopic forms of ball lightning. This work coming out of the Ukraine, Andrei Adamenko, it's a father-son team, and this is the theorist, Vytrotsky, Vysotsky. This is an incredible transmutation. This is a mega transmutation experiment coming from what they call coherent super compression, using a big type of EV, so it appears. The Koreas have done tremendous work in, in identifying exactly where on the plasma discharge do you want to be. They, they stress the front edge, and we'll, we'll get into that. Ed Gray, is, we apply Korea's principle to Gray's motor and explain how we can get the cold currents from Gray's tube. 
And this is the find of the year. Christopher Arnold's experiment, he puts it all together using everything. It's like a kitchen sink invention. And, and, and when I read the patent, I said, whoa, I got to share this. Next slide. Peter Grenou has been giving talks since 85 on the water explosions. He does an arc in water. Next slide. These are from the mid 80s. He, he, puts a, he, does, he charges a capacitor with a known amount of power. He abruptly switches it into the water. When the pulse is abrupt enough, it has to be a very sharp pulse, he will cause an explosion It ejects the cork, usually cork right out of the water. He measures the height of the cork. And he uses the, the inductance. There's always stray inductance. He wants to minimize that and gets as sharp a spike as possible. If he does not get a sufficient rise time, Nothing happens. It's a normal discharge in water. He has to get it very, very sharp before the anomalous event occurs. And he mentioned in the early experiments, he would just blow out the bolts on the side of the container. And, and he was only measuring the, the height of the, the cork. I said, the cor heck with the cork. What about the bolts? <laughs> so next slide. <laughs> Gary Johnson at Kansas State University repeated the experiment. And what he did is he rigged up tracks where he could blow apart a couple of weights from the explosion and then measure how far they go up the track, how far he propels it. And now he was able to prove he has, not, has an energy anomaly in addition to the force anomaly. He's, he has more energy from propelling these weights up than he has on the original capacitor bank uh, to fire off the explosive discharge. So they, both Gary Johnson and Peter Grunow has done tremendous work in proving you can get an anomaly just simply by pulsing water fast enough. Next slide. Peter Grenou later improved this device so he doesn't blow it apart. And uh, he uses the spark gap to trigger it. And in high-speed photography, he was able to detect a plasma ball that would persist uh, for a few milliseconds uh, at the top of the muzzle while he fires off a fog jet. And the fog jet has tremendous energy in it. And it's cold. It's not thermal. They, they measure the temperature. The, on 36 joules worth of energy on the capacitor, he can launch some balsa wood and propel it up. If he multiplies it by 100, he can punch holes in a quarter inch aluminum just with this fog jet. And it's cold. Next slide. A true anomaly. Now let's revisit PAP's engine, the famous PAP engine. Uh, the late Eugene Maloff's wonderful magazine had a whole magazine featuring the PAP engine. What excited me about this was seeing some of the contemporary replication attempts to being done today to replicate the PAP engine experiments with some degree of success. Next slide. PAP engine just fires a piston. He uh, has noble gas in the chamber, a mixture of noble gases. These electrodes he has he has some weak radioactive material like thorium or radium because what he wants to do is create a glow plasma in the chamber. That's what he does. And then he has a very abrupt pulse to fire it. Next slide. I'll show you the details. Uh, the simplest patent is his first patent to show, show the details. He uses this filament here to create the abrupt pulse. He just uh, triggers the filament uh, to burn out like a flash bulb, creates the glow plasma in the region. Here's the, here's the electrodes to uh, create the glow plasma. These have the radioactive material in them. This is a backup filament. And basically, the, the piston would go here and would shoot it, out, shoot it out this direction on the piston. That's quite a simple experiment. Next slide. Uh, he, this was approximately his, his inert gas mixture. It had a tiny bit of little chlorine in there, a tiny bit of water. And what I believe he made from this, because the literature supports this, is next slide is he, you can create ion clusters in plasma that have persistence. They can persist on the order uh, of perhaps seconds, but long enough to complete a full cycle of the piston coming, uh, going back and forth. And thus, the plasma remains in an excited state that, that I believe, when he hits with the abrupt pulse, is part of the uh, tapping the zero-point energy. So we keep, we keep everything ionized. Next slide. Here's some of the replication work. Uh, by Hugo and Janus, and they were able to get piston motion, and they've seen a very interesting anomaly. They see damage to the aluminum oxide ceramic that has a tremendously high melting point, and it looks like it's melted, but the nearby aluminum supports are completely intact, whose melting point is, is considerably lower, one-fourth. 
what we, what we see, this is, a, this is a complete anomaly if you assume that the melt, what appears to be melting is thermal. We're going to see from Ken Shoulder's work that we can, we can punch through aluminum oxide as if it's causing the electrodes, the, uh, the electrons to let go. And it, it looks like it's melted. And these explosive discharges, when we study, next slide, EVs. This is Ken Shoulder's name. It came from launching these microscopic form of ball lightning. He uh, originally named it electric vortex, but then he realized, gee, I'm not sure it's a vortex. So then he came with the more abstract name. Where'd you go? Oh. Electron validum, Latin for strong charge. And this year, he, he, he uh, recreated the new buzzword, exotic vacuum object, because he felt that he wasn't quite sure what it was. It's very anomalous, so, but he, know, he felt that it was in there, indeed getting involved with the vacuum and has some very, very interesting anomalous behavior. For example, why it has approximately a charge of 10 to the 11th electrons, and it carries along 10 to the 6 ions. Most of them are negative. But the anomaly is he sees positive ones th themselves. He does deflection experiments to get the L E over M ratio, and they appear to have, they appear to be light, like a positron. Yet, they're not a collection of positrons because he doesn't get any annihilation gammas that you would get with, from an antimatter matter, uh, reaction. So it's, this is the big anomaly. And I told Ken, you've got you to continue to research that. that. That is the most important anomaly because it takes us right to the threshold of what is charge. That's very tough to explain. That is, Are we creating this macroscopic thing from the vacuum due to, let's say, if you're a vortex ring fan, you would say due to the helicity of the vortex ring, and now you can make a positive one out of the vacuum? Or Ken just suggested that the field around these EVs create an inertial propulsion type of effect where, where things that get trapped in the field, like let's say ions that were trapped in the field, would now get like, like a flying saucer drive accelerated so they wouldn't look heavy, and thus they look light in the experiments. This is the critical anomaly that would break through uh, the, uh, to the understanding, the fundamental understanding of vacuum engineering and understanding what elementary charge really is. Next slide. He launches them quite simply. The early experiment simply uses a sharp pointed cathode, charge up a capacitor, and he can make the small ones with just picojoules, just a small amount of a pulse coming from it, and then he launches it through the anode. Next slide. Trouble is it blows off the top, blows off, wears out the tips real fast, so what he invented was a mercury tipped or liquid metal tipped electrode so it would constantly regenerate the tip. Very clever. Next slide. What are the details that are happening at the tip of the electrode? This is a blow up of the very tip. This work comes, this theoretical work comes from Mesots uh, in the USSR, who calls them ectons. What he suggests is that uh, during, just before the firing of the EV, the tip, the metal or the liquid metal tip melts and becomes a liquid. And there's a polarization. It starts to protrude out, protrude, yeah, protrude out. And there's a and there's layer of ions in the corona. And they have a polarized corona around them. And then what happens? Next slide. It abruptly blows its top. This transition from matter to plasma could be very important. It could be the key transition for for creating uh, a coherence in the vacuum energy. And notice the circulation that you get. From this, notice that you get compression. We have positive here, positive here in the corona. We have compression event occurring between two layers of ions. And we have a circulation that looks like a vortex ring. Next slide. And it would form up into a vortex ring filament that closes on itself because from the liquid metal, it's perfectly symmetrical. It's very hard to make a lightning bolt close on its tail. And here it's done immediately to create, that's why ball lightning is hard to make. If it's a vortex ring model, it makes it naturally from this theory. Next slide. It has to involve the vacuum energy. In a physical review, Ziokowski uh, publishes a, a, a theory that shows under these abrupt switching times how the vacuum energy gets trapped 
in, in these potential fields and creates an organization that could trap the electrons. So here in the physical review, there's papers supporting the concept of a vacuum energy interaction to try to explain the anomaly of, of how the EV can exist because after all, you can't have all that charge clumped together. It would fly apart from Coulomb repulsion. Next slide. One of the anomalies that he wished to share with Peter Gnu, Ken Shoulders drove across country just to talk to him about this in the late 80s. He found that if he created a water vortex down a, uh, it's probably 10 microns in diameter, rifled borehole, so it would spin the water and fire an EV approximately one micron in size right down the gap, he would create a tremendous water explosion out the other end, right? just tremendous force. And the problem was they had a heck of a time trying to tap this force. It was so huge, it would damage anything on this side. He said, just punch holes in everything. He said it was like, shooting a bullet at a windmill blade, trying to tap the energy. Very, very bad impedance mismatch on what you have over here. That's the problems with working with EVs or ball lightning directly. They, they damage whatever they hit, especially these powerful little ones. Next slide. We see similar phenomena in fractal emission. This is where you break a crystal, there's a glowish plasma in the, cr in the crack. It persists sometimes for hours. It's, it's anomalous, they can't quite explain it. Shoulders feel, oh yeah, we're just making EV, it's off the dendrites in the crack. That's all we're doing, we're just launching some EVs. And it's the same as the earthquake lights, the ball lightning that comes out of the fissure of an earthquake. And uh, it's well studied in the literature, and it's, it's a well-known anomaly. Uh, next slide, oh, there's some interesting things that happen. They can see transmutation events in it. In fact, EV strikes produce transmutation. One of the best transmutation experiments that Ken likes to do is you do, you do a single strike, you analyze it. If you do a lot of strikes, you get a, a lot of different transmutation of different elements that weren't there in the first place on the target. And that's, uh, they like to use that to explain uh, the transmutation observed in cold fusion, where we see all these anomalous uh, ions, no, I'm sorry, uh, nuclei, it's not just from fusion, uh, we're, we're converting to metal nuclei, and we're converting it to a wide range of things. I says, boy, that's, that's a hard one to take, but if you want to see uh, the, the mega, mega tr tr transmutation experiment, next slide, it's coming out of Ukraine. They just started this work, I think 2001, they had the first success. They take, uh, shoulders will work at uh, picojoules, they, they're a kilojoules, and they're smashing a target, right? It looks like a giant EV type of thing. They don't talk too much about the coherent driver. They smash a target, and, and not only they get transmutation in the target, what's in what's left of the target, but scatters everything on the screen. They have a collecting screen. This lab in the Ukraine is very big. It's like 120 people employed. They have the university and the professors there supporting the laboratory. This is not just some uh, garage guy. This is legitimate supported research, and this, they're seeing super transmutation. Let's, next slide. Here's what the uh, tungsten target looks like after they smash it. Next slide. Here's the copper target. It's approximately, I think, 10 microns in size in the target. Next slide. Oh, if they hit cobalt 60, they're detecting a reduction in radioactivity. They make sure they don't lose anything. They, they capture everything in the screen. And they're anywhere from 30 to 50% reduction in radioactivity, they're noticing. Next slide. Next slide, please. In the screens, they, 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 they detect bands of the K particles where they exist in the band as if a heavy particle penetrated and then decayed at a certain point. In fact, they can compute how heavy the particle would have to be to get in there, and it's tremendous, way above the atomic weight of, of all our elements. Uh, we're, we're, uh, they're above, they're detecting 300 to 500 atomic weight. Next slide. When this decays, when this particle decays and in the screen, they see it decaying into a, a wide range of everything. All, it's like across the periodic table. They said the typical decay products from this heavy super compressed nucleus is typically a, a nuclei who have equal number of neutrons and protons. That's their typical decay product. And they often get uh, unusual isotopes that are just not found naturally. The experiment works every time, and they're so well equipped to detect everything. They have, they have some, something like 10 different means of detecting uh, the isotopes and the nature of the nuclei. Next slide. The, the mind-blowing 
part is they're finding stable particles that stay in the screen with huge atomic weights. These should not exist. These, these are way, uh, uranium's down here, right? We're, we're way out of bounds. Way out of, and they find these stable particles. This is, this is the mind-blowing part of the paradigm shift. That, uh, we're, we're in completely new nuclear physics, all created by the super compression from this EV. So that, that's, that is the paradigm mega blower. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, Vitrosky came up with this theory during super compression that it builds up. The, the uh, super heavy nuclei is gathering the lattice nuclei into it. And as it's gathering, it also can start to shed small nuclei off of the, the decay products. And this is all the compression zone. It's just this big, big, huge compression to do that. So they, they have a theory, and the theory gets more bizarre. They said, that they, they, uh, some of the theory says we can get super, super heavy nuclei uh, up above 1,000, uh, and there's supposed to be some stability point uh, somewhere way up there. So it's really, it really gets speculative as, as far as I'm concerned. Next slide. The Koreas, I think, did the best work as far as drilling into the exact operating point of, of how to work a plasma, how to work a glow plasma, to get the anomaly. And I think when, when, the, when history looks back on this, they'll be like um, uh, the Currys, a husband and wife team uh, for, for vacuum energy dynamics or ether dynamics, um, the same as the Currys were given credit for radioactivity. Next slide. They make simple parallel plate tubes, and they, and they bias the tubes up to create a glow plasma. And what they do is they want to fire a pulse and then quench the pulse. Next slide. And this is the decay characteristic. It's a voltage amperage uh, display. And their operating point is right here. It's a negative resistance spike. The voltage of uh, glow, oh, where'd he go? Oh. The voltage builds up and then there's a discharge. Now the trick is immediately quench the arc. Anything following is lossy, just electron flow in the arc. You only work with the precursor of the pulse, the very front edge. Right? The faster you can quench it, the more efficient the system. Because off of this front edge is, is where the polarization wave gets launched, the vacuum polarization wave that creates the cold current effect. Next slide. They actually use it in, in standard switching technology. Uh, th this is the hollow cathode switches. They build up a lot of glow plasma, and then when they're ready to fire, sometimes they use a little lazy to laser to fire it. It fires a clean switch, nice clean switch. But nobody in, this, in the engineering business is looking for anomalies. They're just looking for a very fast switch. And the, all the anomalies are on the front end, but the few that look, Ken, Ken Shoulders goes to these conferences, and they call them pseudo sparks. Sure enough, they see some of the EV activity. Next slide. Whatever happened to Ron Kovac? He used to come to these conferences. I loved his work. He did plasma shaping work. He was doing all the right stuff, pulsing a plasma, shaping the plasma. Uh, he, gave, uh, he gave presentation after presentation uh, at the Tesla conferences. And um, then I haven't heard from him. So if anybody knows, I'd be interested. During the question and answer, maybe we'll hear from him. Ed Gray won Inventor of the Year in 1976. Right, for his pulse capacitive di discharge engine. This engine would run cold. It, it had, he had evidence of a cold current effect. It was completely anomalous. They made a mistake early on of, of saying, oh, I think free energy, free energy. And of course, they got in trouble with the SEC and every, it drew, drew all this unnecessary attention to, to himself. But it was a wonderful electrical engine. Next slide. The principle is, especially how I understood it back uh, in the 70s when I first studied it, um, he creates the pulse, it, enter, it sparks across, these coils are wound such that they're in a bucking configuration and propels the rotor. And then the pulse returns through another set of coils, not shown, and recharges the battery or capacitor bank, whatever, whatever he's doing. It's, it's quite simple, but you go, whoa, there's so many things wrong with this. It's like a joke. And all the engineers know it's lossy to make sparks. You've got all this pulsing in here. And what are we doing pulsing inductive loads? Uh, inductors resist pulses. That's kind of dumb. Right? Next slide. Nonetheless, he would create the cold current effect. It was only later, in 1986 and 87, I learned about his tube. And the patent, he, re he patents the same thing twice. And we have a, down here is the anode, a spark gap right here, resistor to help slow down too much 
charge on the anode. And here is the double-walled cylindrical cathode that acts like a hollow cathode where we build up low plasma. Next slide. Here's a blow-up of it. Where'd he go? Here's the spark gap. Let's look at the details of what that plasma, that corona inside the hollow cathode is doing. The anodes charge up to about 3,000 volts relative to the cathode. It polarizes the plasma. When the discharge occurs, there's two modes. We can, when we fire the spark gap, we lower the voltage on the anode just for an instant, and we cause the electrons to fly out, and we cause the ions to fly in. And this is po a portion of the cylinder. Next slide. There's, and, the pulse, and here we have an ion compression event. When as the ions jerk in, it creates compression towards the anode. So the polarization wave from the ions gets, gets thrust on the anode and actually goes out the ground portion of the circuit. So this is where the magic is. If we, next slide, if we create a full-blown discharge, which I believe Gray did not want to do, he had a, it appears that he had a fuse or a spark gaps to prevent against this, but it, this is a full compression discharge where we dump the entire capacitor that's keeping the tube charged up, uh, creating a giant compression event. Of course, such an event would activate the vacuum energy, but this mode, I believe, would just create a normal electron pulse. We actually are creating standard conduction uh, currents. It was the snapback mode that, that actually creates just the polarization pulse without electron conduction. No electron flow, just a polarization jerk from the ions. That's why this tube is great, because it allows the hobbyists to play around with this idea. Next slide. But super compression is exactly what they do in the theta pinch device. And then sure enough, in this device, Eric Lerner uh, on his website, uh, they're getting tremendous heats and temperatures. He thinks it can produce fusion. In fact, it can produce, next slide, hydrogen boron fusion, which is a clean fusion. It goes right to helium. And uh, it has big advantages, no radioactive waste, no neutrons, outputs directly from electricity, tremendous temperatures. And guess what he observes from their measurements that's occurring inside this, uh, inside this compression, big compression plasma-focused device. Next slide. A plasmoid, just like the ball lightning, right inside the device. I think he's getting it from the vacuum energy. And if they do experiments with inert gas, they just might see that and say, whoa, how, where's all the energy coming from? I didn't even fuse anything. So I think Eric Lerner's going to have a surprise in store. Next slide. Uh, here's, my, here's my find of the year. This is Christopher Arnold. He made a motor generator, does both, does all things. He spins, he spins a special drive that's going to excite some coils with some magnets in the drive. And here is his pulse plasma spinning commutator. Next slide. Here's a view of the spinning commutator. This is actually like a giant tube because he seals it off. He, has, uh, he can put any gas mixture he wants in it to do his experiments. Next slide. Here's uh, from the patent. Uh, here's the spinning commutator, and this little thing right there, that's the stator uh, electrode. And here it is right here. Stator. And this thing's spinning, this thing's firing off and quenching, immediately quenching for each cycle. And that he's, he, thus he's writing at the optimal mode. Do not allow conduction currents to build up. Just work with the front edge of the pulse. Next slide. He has magnetic coupling here to, dry, uh, to drive a drive shaft that has magnets embedded in it, and as the, ma as the drive shaft spins, it uh, puts energy on a pickup coil and there's a driver coil. So it responds to pulses, and, it, and then it also launches pulses on the coils. And what's very clever is he phased everything up, such that in the pole, he has tuning circuitry that drives the pulses, such that each pulse is contributing to driving the system, it keeps to, as well as pr providing uh, electricity. So everything is phased up so that it moves the commutator, and then the reverse pulse is in the opposite direction. So it's a very, very clever piece of engineering and inventing, because it's like he put it all together. And the big claim here is the coils on the drive shaft get colder. He, do, he does um, IR sensing and things like that. When he runs the device, he's producing the cold current effect. And I go, how in the world do you get the patent? Well, well when I read the patent, I, I really laughed at the way he phrased it. He, he said it something like this. He said, I, I am surprised at the amount of, I'm surprised at the amount of heat loss. 
and the examiner's going, oh, of course there's heat losses, you dummy, you, you sparked it. No, he didn't mean that. He mean, I lost heat, I cooled. The device actually cooled. So he phrased it in such a way, it went right over past the examiner, because I said, man, you got so many anomalies here. I said, kudos to him. By the way, if you want to get your patent, that's the, that's the trick. You, uh, uh, you work around, you make it sound like standard stuff. That's how you do it. Next slide. Because this looks like a dummy device. You say, what, a, what a dummy. Look, he's doing all these stupid things. It has to have losses everywhere. And yet, it's just the opposite. I don't know if it self-runs because I don't know if about the details. But I'll tell you, to get to any of these things for references, all you do is put the inventor's name in quotes and then just put a couple of the key words, the pulse plasma. Um, in fact, I, f I found the device by just typing the title of my talk, talk in Google and out popped his stuff. So I said, all right, it's meant to be here. <laughs> Uh, Peter Linderman uh, uh, wrote uh, a great book, Coal, uh, Coal Electricity, talking about the importance of the abrupt unipolar pulse to, to launch it. And, and I became a real fan of Peter Linderman because he's been sharing so, so well. That he's really, from behind the scenes, has helped move the community along uh, to make the discovery. Next slide. I, I like Peter's uh, hypothesis regarding a Swiss ML converter. He says these uh, Leyden jars, as they call them, are really giant fat gray tubes with the hollow cathodes and, and the spark gap in the middle. And uh, that's, not, that's not a bad idea. And they use the uh, Wimshurst -like the thing, uh, type of thing to provide the high voltage, right? And uh, all this corona. And that's for show, and that's for go. Next slide. How do, we, how do we tap sharp pulses? Very, uh, normally, uh, it's tough to, uh, tough to engineer. This, this circuit, which is the pulse current multiplier, was effectively used by Hyde, William Hyde and his patent in 1991. And what we do is the pulses, we charge up the, the capacitor bank in series, and then we bleed it off in parallel. And this can be just stray inductance. These inductors are just electrical engineering symbols, because if the pulse is sharp enough, all you need is long leads here, and the polarization pulse will go down, well, that's too fast, go down the series path. But it goes fast because it's a pulse. Next slide. So in summary, uh, the engineering principle is just abruptly cause a discharge in the glow plasma. That's all it takes to produce the anomaly, to get an activation of the vacuum energy. The best mode is when we polarize the plasma and abruptly snap it back, so we only get an ion pulse without electrical conduction. But if we should get compression and, and cause a full-blown discharge, well, so be it. You're going to get something for that, too. Uh, there's probably all sorts of inventing that can be done by shaping the glow plasma. Uh, Bucking electromagnetic fields and counter-rotation are, are similar because uh, electromagnetic fields represent a hand in this spin. And uh, since nature likes to produce things in pairs, if we're trying to engineer the vacuum and get something out of it, we try to work in pairs that conserve angular momentum and that sort of thing. So that's another principle that I see applied to many, many uh, energy devices. And if you want to learn more, next slide. Uh, there's the books. About the energy part. Thank you very much. Do you have time for, for some questions? Do you have a website or contact information? Um, for me, uh, yeah, just just Google my name, and you'll you'll get to you'll get to my my stuff. Um, if you want to personally contact, well, I, I do that privately. Um, oh, plenty of questions. Amori, this is a Harvey Fiala. When you uh, create your uh, charge clusters, if you were out in orbit where there's no atmosphere, <clears throat> can you eject them a long distance, for example, and they re retain their cluster characteristics? For example, if a satellite was out there and had one of your charge cluster generators, could it uh, point it at something say five miles away, and the charge cluster not diminish or dissipate? Would it go continue on? Um, Ken Shoulders found, as he works with him, that they, they're stabilist if they're riding on a substrate. A pardon? Uh, they're riding on a dielectric substrate, t t typically grooves in the dielectric. When they fly off into space, and he's, he's tried experiments like that, uh, they typically uh, decay away. Uh, there's, uh, 
Oh, study Ken Shoulder's work. It's incredible. If you want to just get to the heart <coughs> of, of, of the details of, of vacuum engineering. Uh, but they, they don't it. obey the inverse square law, though, do they, as uh, a particle, as a cluster? Uh, they, they have charge that appears to obey the inverse well, square law. I mean, law. to me, I, it, I, it looked like the charge cluster stays together instead of obeying an inverse square law as it goes a mile away. But uh, um, yeah, there's, there are anomalies. You know, you stay, when, he ta when he's able to make, um, when he sees how the pattern of uh, damage they do to plates, it looks like they were a necklace of 10 of them in a row. And what we suspect is it started out as a big vortex ring that gradually decayed. And it looks like it was 10 clusters. The big anomaly on charged clusters, of course, is why do they cluster? It shouldn't happen. There's something going on with the vacuum dynamics that allows this to happen. And, and whatever's going on clearly grabs excess energy. So uh, I'm going to interpret it that in the, for a short distance, they, they attract and cluster together. But if you sp send them out like 10 or 100 miles away, somehow they're going to dissipate, uh, either completely or mostly. Would, would you say they'd completely dissipate after 100 miles or something, or well, or pro probably considerably sooner than that. They're a stable. Pardon? They're stable when they ride on a dielectric. I think part of the reason for that is they create an image charge in the dielectric that helps There's hold it. Toroid. Okay. Thank you. Pardon me. They're toroid. Toroid. Yes. They're like the vortex ring. Toroids. Appreciated your presentation. Uh, with, uh, would you consider yourself a theorist mainly? Okay, let me, let me, the second part of my question. Um, you've, you've gone through a lot of information here, very interesting. Um, I would like to hear from you your assessment of who is closest to implementing this technology in a workable commercial application. Well, in my opinion at the moment, I think there, there are teams that are quietly exploring the gray tube, which, which is still my top pick because it's for the hobbyist, it, it gives you the most activity that, that you can do in your garage. It's the type of experiment. You can, get, you can start to get anomalous effects. And uh, many, many of these teams want to work quietly. Nobody's ready to come forth with their, with their big, big announcement of, of, of the so ones that are quiet. Um, I, I imagine you're in touch with several of them, and it, it's proprietary information, but could you give us an idea of um, a time frame of when we're going to see a device in the marketplace that somebody can actually purchase that's tapping into zero-point energy? And are you involved in such research yourself? Well, I'm clearly involved. Mm -hmm. But, you, but you, ask, you ask a deeper question. The issue is not technical. There, there are political issues here. There yeah, are, it's uh, political. And that, that gets into uh, another topic. In fact, Tom Ballone a couple of years ago had a whole conference dedicated to this topic. Frankly, that's the issue that's stopping it. There's nothing wrong with technologies. And, and inventors are keeping their heads, keeping really low profiles right now. They don't want to end up like Eugene Mallon. So, so what you're saying is that the technologies here it's just a matter of politics keeping them from making it into the marketplace. I believe that's the case. Uh, my question relates to Joseph Papp's work. You mentioned three gases, uh, xenon, argon, and you, uh, we kind of blazed through the, the slide. What was the other gas that was uh, in, uh, incorporated in that work? Xenon, argon. Um, uh, there was a little bit of chlorine and a little bit of water, uh, deoxygenated water. Uh -huh. um, and of course, uh, you can get to the PAP stuff on the web and get the details. It's okay. so easy. Jo Joseph PAP. All right. And, okay. As for the particle weapons, you got to join SEAL Team 1. They got that. So. <laughs> Boys yeah. and their toys. It always <laughs> comes back to weaponry. The, the guy with the biggest gun wins. <laughs> Uh, that, which brings me to my question. Um, are you familiar with the high pressure diamond anvil transmutation of transuraniums using the high pressure diamond anvil to, to transmutate transuraniums in an unstable state? Really? 
I, I'm personally not familiar, but I'm fascinated that we can do it with just, just mechanical. Well, it's, it's literally been brought into a particle. It's, it's not really a particle beam weapon, but it, they take a transuranium, place it in a standard cartridge, magnetically bottle a boresight of a weapon, and then basically uh, using gunpowder, they create the high pressure, which drives the two diamond anvils together, transmuting the thin layer of transuraniums in between and completely annihilating or, or transmutating this unstable transuranium into pure energy and reflecting it using this bottling technique onto a target. Uh, we sold, a, well, we actually gave it to a certain country in the Middle East, 50 of these transuranium rifles and 10,000 rounds of uh, invisible, recoilless, in, uh, no sound, 10,000 rounds of this ammunition to this country. And like I said, you know, if you've seen ever seen some of Hollywood's, uh, era, uh, I think it's Eraser, where they've got a, a, a rail gun. Are you familiar with that movie? Uh, yes. Okay, you see the guy going out there and firing. Well, this thing does the same thing, only it does a total transmutation onto the target, completely annihilates everything. It's like cutting holes that go on and on and on. And, uh, but there's no sound, no recoil. And the only thing that when the gas pressure begins to bleed through as it transmutates, it just spits the cubic zirconium diamonds out the end of the barrel. So that already exists. <laughs> So, it, so encourages, it encourages them to shoot. Right, yeah. <laughs> well, the thing the is, is uh, <laughs> until recently, uh, any time they used this weapon, they swept, they would have teams in place to sweep down and get rid of all the witnesses who would say it would cause a, a major traumatic, uh, you know, when you see a guy stand there and he gets terminated by, there's a, he was there all in one piece one time, and the next time you see me, there's a, this huge hole that you can look through. And these teams would actually have to go down there and what they call cleaning. You know, they'd clean and sweep the place up. They'd terminate everybody that saw the, the effect, which was pretty bad, you know. I mean, this, but as far as using this high-pressure diamond anvil transmutation, isn't there a way we can do this without, you know, as far as using the weapons, but uh, instead of going with the biggest guns on the block, uh, converting that using some of the methodology that we, you, you presented, is there a way we can, can uh, produce some transmutations that are, uh, you know, favorable on the other side of the fence using the same uh, yeah, concept? Uh, of course, the, the whole idea is don't take it so far. Right. I mean, you know, it doesn't, you know, that's, that's Ken Shoulder's problem with the EV, right? Mm -hmm. it, it hits something, it damages it. You, you, can't, you can't make a practical device if it's just going to flake apart. Right. So uh, you work with the precursor. Where you work, you don't take it all the way up to that energetic level. You work with the precursor, just the front edge. Uh, instead of forming it all the way up in the ball lightning, you start to form it. You just get the polarization wave. So you basically you you work with keep it weak, keep it unconcentrated. Right. So, so it's well, kind of like common well, sense. So it's a shame it's so easy to. to, to well, make that it. diamond anvil process has its uh, positive aspects because basically a, a fire team can land in a helicopter and use this technology to detonate transuraniums that the half-life are anywhere from 20 minutes to two and a half days. 20 minutes, they pop a, bu a bunker buster. We're trying to stop a terrorist. We hit them with a bunker buster. 20 minutes later, we can fly in it with just minimum background radiation. Wow. So it's a new generation of nuclear weapons. But, you know, I, I, I just, I used to work in this field, but, but I don't, you know, I, I hate breaking things to get it to work. I feel like I'm, I'm going into the Marine Corps, you know? How do you get the, those little chemical lights that, that work so well? Well, yeah, I have to break them to get them to work. That's why it works so well in the Marine Corps. Sorry, if, oh, I apologize to all the USMC guys that may be here, but uh, it seems to me that we should be heading into the, the direction of, of uh, caressing the atom, manipulating the nucleus of the atom, rather than worried about, worrying about tired old electrons and breaking things to get energy. So, but I, I just wanted to know if you were aware of that high pressure diamond anvil. Uh, no, but it certainly fits the pattern. Well, I, ho I hope that country's using it wisely. Uh, Otherwise, there's a lot of cleaning to they're, do. They're known for not using things. <laughs> they're rather excitable. I mean, their dogma is uh, the provocative uses of madness. So <laughs> I don't know where that's going either, but you know, it's something that you may want to think about 
and combine that with some of the ideas that Ken has to, uh, you know, it may be a way of, of, you know, on a small scale to get a fusion reaction without creating all the havoc that, that these guys have. So, but thanks. Thank you. I'd like to ask a question that's a follow-up to the one that Sterling asked earlier. And, you know, he asked you about, is there something that's close to being ready to go as far as commercial application? And you said, well, it's the political problem. Now, what if the political barriers were to be brought down? How soon then do you think something could actually, you know, get out in the marketplace? Really? If, if, if an inventoring team was simply allowed to progress and, and not get threatened in, in, in a way, uh, what, do you, what, do you, what do you say, guys? Two years? One year? Two years? N now? If we got people ducking? I, I don't know. Uh, I know. I know the climate's not real friendly right now, and I know people are really distraught, especially our community over Eugene, because, Maloff, because he, he was basically a leader here in the whole, for the whole movement. Wonderful magazine and what he was doing with, right. with Congress and DOE. You know, so uh, you, got, you got a community here that says, gee, you know, if the maybe, you know, some say the world's not ready. Now, your, your implication with Eugene is that he was eliminated from this. Well, he fits the pattern. Who knows the de details? Right. There's no proof here. Right. There's just like, and, and I personally know of four other speakers that I've, uh, that I've got to know coming to these conferences in the 90s who have turned up dead. Yeah. Okay. Well, it, it seem, seems to me that we've got, uh, you know, there's lots of technology leverage right now and lots of things that sound like they're waiting in the wings. But, but the leverage that needs to be applied now is political. And it, it needs to be something that the, the mainstream citizen really gets involved in. And I don't think the mainstream citizen is here. And that's, that's where I think that. <laughs> yeah. I, I have three more slides that illustrate the issue. Would you like to see them? Sure. <laughs> Dave, next slide, please. I, I, I usually don't show these until the topic is brought up. Can I, can I continue my, uh, just want to uh, finish here for just a second before you get into this. But, but that is that. You have to back it up six positions. Yeah. Go, go ahead and ask your question. Knowing that the, these, these type of conferences have been going on for well over a decade, and the, most of the world has no idea that this type of conference with this type of intelligence and integrity and motivation and ambition, uh, the rest of the world doesn't even know that this exists. We have to be able to mobilize the mainstream citizen who right now is very, very primed to have these new energy technologies emerge from, from all different reasons, whether it's just because it's affecting their pocketbook or because they're concerned about the environment or they're tired of seeing their neighbors' sons and their, the males in their own family going off to some place and, and never coming home except maybe dead. And, and the, the time is right to mobilize the mainstream citizens. And, and that's where I would ask everyone to, to start applying some leverage. If you feel we have the technology ready to go, waiting in the wings, we got to start pulling down the political barriers. And that means we have to get regular citizens involved in this movement. And that's, that's where I feel we need to go. Okay, I, I'll show you which movement to follow. Okay, basically what happens to these inventing teams, suppression tactics are brought to them. Academia just laughs at it, says it can't be done. If they go to, they come in as expert witnesses and say it's all fraud, therefore they're duping investors from their money. Uh, the patents are blocked, funding's blocked. It's, it's faulty litigation being framed with the crime. Threats are very common to the poor inventors. Uh, property destruction, Paul Brown's mother's car was firebombed, there's a story, and eventually the co-inventor won't back down, they assassinate him. Next slide, so who's doing it? 
Well, there's three levels, kind of levels of suppression that, I, that I've identified. Level one's academic. It just simply says, we know everything about everything. Therefore, it violates the paradigm. It can't be true. That level's actually pretty harmless. They're just name calling. That's what, that's what Pons and Fleshman are experiencing. They don't really do anything. Uh, level two is pretty obvious. It's business interests. Who would like to see the status quo maintained, right? Everybody says it's easy to, easy to hire a hit man and, and get rid of somebody. So any, any interest in the entrenched economy, entrenched oil interests would like to see it maintained. Level three is more interesting. It's black ops. They have a different concern. Their concern is, uh, could this, is security. You know, what could come from this discovery? And their motives are a little different. They're, they're saying, gee, uh, this might be too dangerous. So they're not after the greed, like number two, just greed factor. They're actually out to protect the world. And from that perspective, their, nobles, their motives are noble. And they, they have a, a legitimate point, and the point uh, should actually be uh, debated. You know, if you have great new technologies, but it is double-edged, energy is energy, right? We can use it wisely, we can use it foolishly. So that's the point. Next slide. This is where I think the solution lies politically. Uh, disclosure projects, there's, there's a website. Stephen Greer says, the black ops know all about this. This is already discovered. So you ask your question, what's ready to go? They got it ready to go, right? Just the government doesn't know about it. In fact, the government doesn't control it. This is in control of corporate interests that are in charge of the, the black ops community. His disclosure project is saying, let's have a testimony to Congress. Right, let's get these people that are willing to testify, these are the engineers that are on the projects, are willing to testify that Congress if granted immunity from their secrecy. I'll say, behold, these technologies are indeed available and, and reasonably developed, right? And, and he says, we just need to get that back under government control, and that's the point of the disclosure project. And that is where the citizen movement should, should turn because he wants Congress to be informed. So that, that's his goal, and I think politically that, that offers a very good, good solution. I agree that, that Steve Greer is a real champion in, in this type of approach. But I also think that even the people in the black ops, they understand that their own children and their, you know, their potential grandchildren, you know, we're riding this train that's headed toward a cliff if we don't change its course. And it doesn't take you know, a, a real leap in vision to see that, that we have to change the course and avert that train wreck. So there's so much pressure, I think, on some of these people that uh, 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 to stay in that, that pattern because they don't see enough noise out there that people want a change. But I think once they see that, then the courage to change is going to come about because I think everyone feels that that we are headed for that train wreck. Even if they're, they're kind of stuck in their pattern, and even if that pattern includes suppression, that's how they earn their living. So I, I would just encourage everyone to, to go ahead and, and speak out. We, got it. we have to not be afraid of this anymore, because if we, if we keep doing what we're doing, it's not going to matter anyway, and we may as well just party on. And I'm not interested in that for my kids. You know, so that's, that's how I feel about that. Thank you. The question is, uh, did you see the article in Popular Mechanics uh, last month? Uh, I didn't, so you have to say it quick so he can say it. Uh, yeah, that, that was uh, basically he was saying that uh, the uh, government was uh, coming out against cold fusion uh, because the uh, uh, process might be an easy source of tritium or deuterium for uh, terrorists. Um. And that, I, I think that's, that could be a valid point. But they yeah. are. It's, it's a good coverage in popular mechanics. They want to look at it because they don't know all the facts. They want to look at it because they don't know all the facts. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, thank you very much, Moray. It's been a great presentation. Thank you.